Since some of the first video games were ever made, people have been reviewing them. Games like Pac-Man, Legend of Zelda, and other classics have not only been reviewed by people, but popular review sites like IGN and GameSpot. But how do they rank their games? Well, everyone rates games differently, but one of the most common aspects of games that people look at is a little something called replay value. But what is replay value? Replay value, or replayability, is a term used to assess a video game's potential for continued play value after its first completion. In layman's terms, whether a game is viewed as replayable. Replay value is based on a number of things, from storyline to controls, etc. But why is replay value used in almost every review? And why is this such an influential aspect to games? Today, we'll be covering a bit more in-depth of what exactly replay value means, as well as why people use it, why it's so important, etc. My name is Volans, and let's get started. Good day ladies and gentlemen, so before I begin to cover replay value, I want to talk about why I'm making this video in the first place. If you follow my channel closely, you may have been watching my playthrough series of Metroid Prime. If you know the game, you probably know that I'm nearing 3 quarters of the way through it already, and I've been making videos for the series for about 2 months now. Metroid Prime is, and always will be, one of my favorite games, but as I look ahead to the future of my channel, I see myself starting up a playthrough series for Metroid Prime 2 Echoes in the not so distant future, and unfortunately, that means that I have to replay the game. No, no, wait, 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 hold on a second. Repeat that last line, and unfortunately, that means that I have to replay the game. What the hell does that mean? It sounds like I'm not looking forward to playing the game. Well, to be quite honest with you, no, I'm not. Why is that? It's because of that replay value I mentioned earlier. So after I complete Metroid Prime for the playthrough series, this will have been my third time completing the game. Twice in over a year. Why? Because I absolutely love this game. But you don't look forward to playing Metroid Prime 2 Echoes? It is a Metroid Prime game, is it not? Shouldn't you enjoy the game? Well, just because I enjoy one game in the series doesn't mean I like all the games in the series, and Metroid Prime 2 is no exception. I mean, look at Sonic 06. This game turned out to be one of the worst sequels ever made, so why do I dislike Metroid Prime 2 so much? Well, it's not just me. Popular game reviewers like Some Call Me Johnny and King K have pointed out that though a game might seem great, there may always be that one thing that blows the whole game out of the water. And unfortunately, Metroid Prime 2 has what I like to call game breakers. Allow me to expand. Metroid Prime 2 was released back in 2004 on November 15th. After Metroid Prime's huge success, Retro Studios and Nintendo wanted to capitalize on that. Before you knew it, Metroid Prime 2 Echoes was born. Unfortunately, the development of Metroid Prime 2 was rushed, which led to major cuts in the quality department. For example, the game was supposed to have more stunning visuals, but because the game was rushed, we missed out on that and we were forced to deal with the original Metroid Prime 2 graphics. Nothing against that. They were really good quality graphics for their time. You can't rush a game, and Retro Studios learned this. One thing that was lost between development and release was an in-depth beta testing, and this showed in two specific boss fights, the Boost Ball Guardian and the Spider Guardian. Let's first talk about the Boost Ball Guardian. On paper, the fight is simple. Damage the Guardian while he spins around in a ball in a tight arena. Sounds easy, right? Well, it was quite the opposite though. The Boost Ball Guardian is one of the most difficult bosses I have ever had to defeat, in any game. When he rolls around the arena, you have no cover from his attacks except for 4 measly pillars which are easily destroyed. Not only that, but he does 50 damage per hit. That's half of one energy tank. Oftentimes, before he finished rolling around, he would hit you multiple times, knocking out a whole energy tank, and then some most of the time. Not to mention, you don't walk into the fight with many energy tanks to begin with. Plus, his attacks are almost entirely unavoidable. The arena is small, the amount of energy tanks you walk into the fight with are low, and can get easily deplenished with only a few hits, there's no light crystals or light beacons to help replenish health, so you're constantly losing health throughout the entire fight. Oh my god, this boss took me at least 10 tries to beat, and I'm not even joking. When I finally beat this guy, I was burned out, but I continued on. On to the Sanctuary Fortress, Samus. Hmm, I wonder what's next. 
Okay, so it looks like we gotta do something with that. And probably avoid that spider ball guardian. Okay. Seems simple enough. Ow. Come on. Ow. Come on. Alright, let's go. Uh, all right, get up. Get up there. Come on, Sam. Let's get up there. Come on. Let's go. This guy infuriated me even more. This fight has three stages, and each one requires perfect timing in order to perform not only single bomb jumps, but double bomb jumps. I would like to note that the footage is played on the HD Wii version, which means that simply by flicking the Wii remote up, you can make Samus jump without having to do a bomb jump, which makes this fight considerably easier, but still really difficult. I mean, look at the footage, you can even see religious Jedi struggling to kill this guy. It just shows that this boss fight is still unnecessarily difficult. Now, I have had a lot of practice with double bomb jumps, and I can perform them 9 times out of 10. However, when you're rushed, the chances of me successfully landing a double bomb jump drop to about 4 out of every 10. And you have to do this numerous times, not to mention that if this monstrosity hits you, you are dealt an extreme amount of damage. Unpredictable boss movements, precision bomb jumping, ramps you need to roll up and then perform bomb jumps, the dreaded fact that there's not a save station for god knows how long before the boss fight, which means that if you fail, you're backtracking far further than you need to in order to try your hand at the boss fight again. I'm sorry, this guy sucks. So what does this have to do with replay value? Well, this game is notorious for these two boss fights. Anyone who has ever played Metroid Prime 2 Echoes knows that these guys were not at all fun. I've played the game all the way through once and I don't plan on doing it again anytime soon because I know the next time I pick this game up, I have to face these two again and I'm not looking forward to it. These two bosses substantially decrease the game's replay value. Why? Because I don't want to play the game again. Remember what I said the definition for replay value was? A video game's potential for continued play value after its completion? In the case of Metroid Prime 2, I do not want to play this game again. So all things considered, the replay value of Metroid Prime 2 is extremely low. So that was an extended example of what exactly replay value is. But what makes a game have bad replay value? Well, in the case of Metroid Prime 2, the game is viewed poorly by critics because of its deplorable replay value. Let's say, hypothetically, the Boost Ball Guardian and Spider Ball Guardian were easier to defeat. Would this increase the game's replay value? Yes, substantially, and in turn would make this game better and viewed more fondly by critics. But how can Metroid Prime 2 be distinguished from other poor titles? Let me answer that question with another question. Take your favorite game. What do you like about it? Is it the game's story? The gameplay? The graphics? Would you play that game a second time? If it's your favorite game, you would want to play it again. Why? Because you love it. What about your least favorite game? It's not something we usually think about, but take a minute and think. What's your least favorite game you have ever played? Would you play it a second time? I don't know. You hate it for a reason, right? Why would you play it again? For me, Metroid Prime 2 is not my least favorite game, but it ranks low on the list because of those two bosses. Would I like to play it again? No. If a game you don't like has something about it you don't like, whether it's a small thing or a big thing, you don't want to play it again because you don't want to have to deal with that same issue again. If an aspect of a game has something about it that you feel prohibits you from playing the game again, it has low replay value. I love Metroid Prime. There are some aspects about it that I don't like though, but by no means do these things prohibit me from playing the game again. In the case of Metroid Prime 2, I feel that because the bosses are such an issue, I cannot play the game again. I don't feel this way about too many games. I like most games, but just because a game has something wrong with it doesn't make it unreplayable. Take for example Star Fox Adventures. Probably one of the least popular games among Star Fox fans because of its choice to stray away from the traditional Star Fox space shooter into a third person melee battle with no interesting characters, a lack of variety, etc. I like Star Fox Adventures, and I agree with those things, but by no means do they stop me from playing the game. For another example, take Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. 
people have complained that they felt robbed of a new, fresh, original evil villain when we found out that the real evil mastermind is Ganondorf. People hate this about the game, but it doesn't stop them from playing the game. It's a classic, one of the best games of its time in my opinion. But the game is not bogged down by literally unplayable portions like Metroid Prime 2. You see what I mean? Just because a game has negative aspects to it, which all games do, don't necessarily drop the replay value. What somebody finds as a negative might be seen as a positive by somebody else. For example, some people don't like 3D Metroid, whereas others love it. Me, myself, I can't play 2D Metroid, but I love 3D Metroid. It's all from the eyes of the beholder. So what distinguishes a game with bad replay value from a game simply with negative aspects? Playability. Does the fact that Ganondorf is the evil mastermind prohibit you from playing the game? No. Does the fact that you cannot even beat the game because a difficult boss prohibits you from playing the game? Yes, that's the difference. Playability versus negative aspects. The Ganondorf aspect of Twilight Princess is seen as a letdown in a negative aspect rather than a prohibitor of replayability. The boosts in Spider-Ball Guardians are seen as a playability issue rather than a negative aspect. So alright, alright, we've covered the term replay value, we've covered what makes a game have poor replay value versus a simple negative aspect, but can a game be good but have poor replay value? And the answer to that is no. If a game has positive aspects to it, it can still have poor replay value, right? There are many things that I like about Metroid Prime 2. I like the other bosses, fix the backtracking, and it's interesting and captivating storyline. However, these positive aspects are overshadowed by the dark cloud that is poor replay value. The fact that the game's poor replay value overshadows all the good things about the game is evidence enough that replay value is so important. Maybe even the most important. Alright, I'm about to stir up some fans here, so please be mature and respectful about this, okay? Ready? I don't like Ocarina of Time. You heard me correctly. I don't like Ocarina of Time. Why? To me personally, it has low replay value. I've completed the game once, and honestly, it feels like I needed motivation to complete the game. I've heard from so many of my friends that Ocarina of Time is one of the greatest games of all time, and I really wanted to like it, but I simply couldn't find a reason why I liked the game, as all the positive aspects of the game were overshadowed by its lack of replayability. So why do I find the game so unreplayable? It's hard to say because honestly I don't really know for sure. I want to say that it's a number of reasons so I'll lay those out. I'm kind of making a mini retrospective of Ocarina of Time right now, but I'll try to make this quick. The graphics were subpar for its era, the storyline was both boring and condescending, the game lacked variety, dungeons felt more like a burden than an exhilarating adventure, progression felt too linear, not that linearity is a bad thing, the characters lacked any sign of personality and therefore felt more like Fi than Midna. I can go on and on, but I think you get the point. If I ever decided to redo Ocarina of Time for the channel, an in-depth retrospective analysis will be in the works, I can guarantee you. So all of these seem more like negative aspects, right? I thought you said it's the difference between playability and negative aspects. Well, to a larger extent, yes. However, if a game is bogged down by so many letdowns and negative aspects that a game becomes more of a burden to play than fun, it loses its replay value. So to go back to the example I mentioned before with Metroid Prime, does it have so many aspects that the game becomes unreplayable? To some, yes. In Metroid Prime, for example, some view the substantial amount of backtracking, lack of realism that relies on a player's suspension of disbelief, and certain enemy encounters as so negative that the game becomes unplayable. For me, these things are neglectable, but to some, they are seen as game changers, and that's perfectly fine. For Ocarina of Time, some of these things that make the game unplayable to me are neglectable to others. However, because I find them as game changers means that they ruin the experience when playing the game. So yes, if a game has many negative aspects present, it can lose its replay value. So there's two ways a game loses its replay value. But why is it so important? If a game is viewed so poorly that the game cannot be played over again, or even finished at all, 
This will have a humongous impact on the game's rating. Whether through a game's playability or a game's massive pile of negative aspects, if a game has poor replay value, the game is simply not good. I would like to stress though, replay value can be subjective, as long as it follows the guidelines of numerous negative aspects. If a game is unplayable to the top level gamers, it is unplayable to all. Metroid Prime 2's difficulty is seen as unplayable to most, if not all, which is why something as serious as that cannot be subjective. Replay value is so important because of all the things that goes into it. Its playability, its graphics, its storyline, all of this is considered when deciding a game's replay value. As I said before, a good game cannot have poor replay value, whereas a bad game always has poor replay value. There is no example I can come up with where replay value is not the deciding factor between deciding whether the game is good or bad. Even if a game is okay, it must have at least some replay value, right? An okay game in my mind would be something like Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. Is the game perfect? Far from it. But it is not a bad game. It has some aspects to it that I adore, however it does have some aspects to it that turned me away, but by no means is the game unplayable. I've beaten the game all the way through and I haven't touched the game in probably 10 years. I've been interested in jumping back into it, potentially for a playthrough series. The game is not a masterpiece, far from it, but it has replay value. It can still be an okay game. So the reason why replay value is so important is because without it, games would be forgotten in the depths of time or will forever live in infamy. Sorry, Sonic 06. If a game leaves a bad taste in your mouth, you may never want to pick that game up again. It's the deciding factor between whether generations after us will pick up these games. If the stigma for a game is so bad that people won't even want to pick that game up, you've just made a decision based on replay value. It's important because it takes in so many key aspects of the game that are all compiled into one phrase. Do you want to play it again? If the answer is yes, then congratulations, you've found a good game, or at least a decent game. If the answer is no, then you've made a decision not to pick up the game, and that's where the discussion ends. Thank you guys for watching, I hope this video was informational. It's hard to explain why replay value is so important, because we just know that it is. So I hope my explanation was helpful in explaining it in more depth. In the future, I plan on releasing another video with a similar theme. What is the inconvenience factor? And why does it turn a good game into a bad game? In this video, I will be covering an aspect of reviewing games known as the inconvenience factor. What it means, what it does, and how it affects games and their sequels. As for the video at hand, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, and or found it informational please like and comment on the video if you would like to see more of me don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell icon if you would like to receive notifications on whenever i upload a video once again thank you guys for watching and enjoy the rest of your day take care